He is an educator. He is one of those guys who, when you ask him a question, grab a seatbelt. Because he will likely, if he doesn't have an answer, then he'll spend some time telling you why he doesn't have the answer and who would have an answer and then what the answer he thinks should be if there was an answer. I mean, is, is that you, Forrest Valkyrie? Oh, is that who we're Are talking about? Guy? You just said he is. I'm, I'm talking about I you. I didn't know where we were uh, going. You, I thought we were going to bring somebody I'm else speaking in. to you <laughs> okay. like you were a deity, like he with a capital <laughs> H, you know, is here. He uh, As he pursues omniscience, yeah, he I is mean, now on the internet educating. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the goal so. is just to know everything. And I'm... God, I'm so far away from that. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. You know, we're wrapping up the year, and I just thought, without really any prep, I didn't send you anything, nope. right? I haven't, I haven't prepped you at all. We're just going to talk yeah. and see what happens. And uh, I'm buckled up. I actually have a literal seatbelt in my chair because because I have to. Damn it, <laughs> right? So, uh, but but you know, you do a lot. I explain to everybody, uh, you are. An educator, yeah. but what does that mean? Like, this, flesh it out for everybody. So it used to mean that I would actually go out into schools and do in-person education. I was what was called an informal educator for about 10 years, which is kind of a, a unique thing for states like mine that don't have really good education systems. So I would go out into schools, libraries, colleges, universities, summer camps, if necessary, you know, wherever there were people that wanted to learn cool stuff. Um and I would do whatever they needed. I would do a class or a workshop. Maybe I'd do like, you know, several sessions over the course of a, a semester. Maybe I'd do like a stage show, you know, whatever it was. If they wanted to fill in and give some supplementary education to their their students, that's what I was there for. And so I've taught everything from pre-K all the way up through like, you know, sophomore year college. Um, and it, it just depends on what they want and how much of it they want. And ever since the pandemic, I've really shifted to just working online. So I still do the occasional live show and I still do the occasional live class. There's a homeschool group that hires me to do once a week. I come in and teach some stuff. Um, but generally, I just teach on YouTube and TikTok and make people fall in love with science the way that I have. You and I are here in Oklahoma. We're neighbors, mm -hmm. so to speak. Aren't we ranked like 49th in education? Like, aren't we near the bottom? If you include... Somewhere? Colleges and universities were 48th. Uh, we have pretty good universities here. But if you're just looking at public education, yeah, we're 49th. There's a big sign as you drive into Oklahoma that says, at least it is in Arkansas. That's 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 <laughs> well, every time I see Governor Kevin Stitt or Ryan Walters, the uh, superintendent of public education or whatever, and they're talking about all the great strides we've made. Mm -hmm. Where? And the advocacy for children. Where? I'm always looking around going, I was born here and I don't know what the hell that you're talking about. No. It just uh, no, it's, blows my it's, mind. It's, it's, it's nowhere to be found. It's a, the, the wins for children are the wins for children of the, of the wealthy. Um, it's like the, you know, you have the school voucher program and things that they're trying to implement everywhere. And it's like, yeah, you, they'll give you a thing where you get, you know, whatever, $7,000 of uh, taxpayer money to go to whatever private school you want. Well, that's not enough to pay for the whole private school tuition. So poor kids still just go to the public schools, which are now less and less and less funded because you're pulling tax dollars to go to almost exclusively religious schools, which is kind of against that whole First Amendment thing. But, you know, whatever. Uh, and so what it really is, is just a, a tax break. It's 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 something to help wealthy families pay for wealthy schools and send their kids to private school. It's just a little paycheck for those wealthy families who are already yeah. going to go to private schools anyway uh, to get private education. Yeah, I mean, it, you're just padding it for the people who had the money anyway. It mm -hmm. just blows my mind. Yeah. I have uh, assembled a list of just random party questions sure. for uh, this sort of end of year show. Uh, just it's random. We're just going to throw random crap at you <laughs> and just see what happens. It's These are designed to be conversation starters. Oh, okay. That's sure. And, uh, we will just kind of see what happens, where it takes us. All bets are off. Everybody just, you've been warned. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Let's, let's are you ready? Let's see what happens. Sure. I, I, you, all, all I know about you told me, let's, let's stream something. That was the prep I've been yeah, given. Yeah. So like, that's all. That's all you need well, I, with Forrest. Let's, let's. That's all you let's need. Let's break the ice. Let's, the man let's get to know has each other. no shortage of opinions, and he has a very large database of facts. This is a one-two punch of podcast goodness. Here we Who go. Who knows what you're going to ask me? Though, like maybe I don't have an opinion on what you have. I don't know what. I'm. 
genuinely terrified. <laughs> let's get started. It's going to be great. <laughs> let's get to, let's do it. What is the worst argument that you have heard, at least recently, proving God? Worst argument. Proving God. <sighs> yeah, somebody says, I have a proof for God, and it is X. Ah, oh, flip, dude. Um, it, it's hard because I've gotten some arguments from some people that I really don't want to platform, but it's very obvious who I'm talking about. Uh, I had recently one guy called in while I was on the line and tr- tried to say something about how, like, we as atheists and me especially as a scientist don't understand the sun and that solar energy is somehow proof of, I, I genuinely don't know what he was driving at. It, you, you can look it up on the last time I was on with Jimmy. It's it just the most bizarre conversation possible. Uh, and then I th- the one that was definitely about God, I think that one was about God. He said he was, he said that he didn't believe in God, but that he definitely wasn't an atheist. So I don't know what the hell was going on there. But the one that was definitely about God was uh, the guy who called into AXP. I think it was the last time I was on and said that uh, the 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 fact that l- every single civilization in the whole world has a seven day work week. Uh, that proves Jesus because <laughs> Jesus said he would unite the world on something. And that that that's it. That's what he did. He made sure that we all had a seven day calendar. And like the argument was. I was on with uh, uh, Jamie the Blind Limey. He's a super nice guy. I don't know if he's watching this, but hey. Uh, he, the, the, the argument was that everybody was doing this, and that's proof of God. Um, and he, he was steadfast that like, if, if any major country decided to have an eight-day week, that would make him an atheist and disprove his religion, which, what a metric. Uh, and and like, my position was that I don't believe your premise that, that God is responsible for this, I, I think that it's a lot more likely that the same genocidal uh, uh, force that wiped its way across the whole planet and kind of homogenized the culture of the global north as we know it today, that also probably had a lot to do with the whole seven-day week thing. And then also, like, just utility, you know, the same reason that every country in the world, except for two of them, use the metric system. It's just easier to do that. We have, you know, different calendars all around the world. People have, you know, different dates and different years in, in the Chinese calendar and the Buddhist calendar and the Hebrew calendar. But we all just say 2023 because it's just more convenient. And so the seven day thing seems to kind of be the same thing. But no, this guy was dead set on that. And then Jamie the Blind Limey was just uh, uh, rejecting the, the conclusion. He said, even if I grant the premise... What a dumb way to prove your existence. You you couldn't start a TikTok account and be like, yo, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm here to do the thing. I died for your, I'm I'm a DJ and I died for your spins. But no, it's, you just had to leave it the way it is with seven days and also all the murder. I don't know, man. That was probably the weirdest one that I've gotten in recent memory. (laughs) That, uh, I'm so almost sorry I asked. That's bizarre. <laughs> we don't understand All the right. sun because we weren't members of the military, and and the seven day week proves Jesus. Those are those are the weirdest ones for sure. I think we think we talked about that the guy Nephilim Free who said that the reason that there are craters in the moon is because of uh, ejected water which became ice during Noah's flood, and it shot through space and it impacted. The moon, and that's why they were all, craters. All those that's things that happen, for sure. <laughs> that's up there, yeah. <laughs> okay, real. beyond activism, what creature that is not currently, what creature should be made into an animal cracker? Like an extinct like if creature? If you think about a box, uh, it can be extinct or live, but they're not in the box. Yeah. It's not the elephant. It's not the lion. Lystrosaurus. Right? What animal What animal deserves to be an animal cracker? Lystrosaurus. Forest found kind. Lystrosaurus. Absolutely. It, L- Lystrosaurus li- lived. So the Lystrosaurids, because I'm pretty sure there were a couple of different species of them. But they, uh, uh, yeah, they lived during the Permian. Uh, the, the, the name literally means shovel lizard. And they were just these things about the size of a pig. Looks about like one as well in terms of like body shape. And they had a, a horrible little beak and also two tusks uh, for, for digging up roots and tubers and stuff. And they were just super hardy cool animals that actually survived the Permian extinction for a little bit, if I remember correctly, and like lived uh, just a bit into the Mesozoic era with the dinosaurs and whatnot. Yeah, they're just, they're funky little guys. And I think kids would love them if they got to know about it. Because I imagine animal crackers specifically is something that like kids get geeked up about. You know, I'm not going to put a trilobite in there. All right. Uh, Say it again slowly because you're, you are lightning fast. 
is it L- Listrosaurus? Listro, like L- Listro. Listrosaurus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can pull up a picture of one. Listrosaurus. Listrosaurus. All right, Listro. I learned something new, new today. Um, do you think, this is going to be a hot button, do you think there should be at least a temporary moratorium on Marvel movies? Right? People are starting to get fatigue, is what they say. Yeah. I'm kind of marbled out. What do you think? I, flip, dude. Come on. Uh, kind, sure. If, no, I don't know. Uh, they make enough people happy. <laughs> and like, especially kids need something to be cheery about nowadays because we live in a capitalist hellscape and, and, and there's no hope for the future and there's a genocide going on currently. And it's like, there's a lot of shit to be sad about. So if the Marvel movies can make somebody smile for a minute, especially a child, I think that's probably an okay thing to do. Uh, I, I, for me personally, that they're okay. Uh, I don't get out of bed. Do you? Uh, sorry, you're going to talk about capitalist hellscape. Is that how you feel about the Christmas holiday? That's Is how it I feel about capitalized to the point where everything, everything. <laughs> well, well, everything, especially here in America, but in 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 most of what you might call the West. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. I I am overwhelmed by how much I I'm aware that I'm being marketed to. Mm. And, you know, when you're you see the commercials, everybody's too perfect, a little bit soft focused. Mm-hmm. Their teeth are amazing and they are way too cheery as the bells are going on yeah. and they're all opening whatever gifts they bought. Right. Purchased for someone else, which is how you demonstrate or prove your love mm-hmm. is you, know, you base that value it. on whatever you put it under the tree and whatnot. And I do enjoy the season. But I do fight cynicism. You're just a straight up cynic. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah. Well, so, see, the thing is, like, I'm I'm super down with the idea of having a a, a ceremonial feel good day and and having a time that's really dedicated towards you know togetherness and family and love and joy and all that stuff. It just really sucks when it gets painted over with this this you know image that's meant to help you forget about all the people that don't get that. You know, the, 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 the people who don't have a family usually recently um, to celebrate with, the people who don't have food, uh, the people who are currently freezing on the street. You know, you talk about the weather outside is frightful. Well, guess who, you know, doesn't have a coat. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the thousands and thousands of homeless, especially here in, in Oklahoma where we live. I think there's, you know, tens of thousands of homeless children, especially. And it's like this. That kind of sucks. Especially because the same kind of consumerism and and greed and nonsense that made the holiday what it is today is also responsible for that problem. So, like, like I said, I I have no problem, especially for kids. I I'm super down with with giving children some time to just be children and be happy. It, it's not for them to sit there and be really upset and worried about the world. It, you know, if there's nothing you can do about it, it's just cruel to give them that much weight. However. We as grownups, I think, have kind of a moral responsibility to do a little bit more than we're doing. And that isn't to say that anybody should be ashamed of or feel bad about enjoying Christmas or spending time with their family or whatever holiday you celebrate at this time. It doesn't mean anybody should feel bad about that. You know, you can give each other gifts and have a nice meal and and, and spend some time with each other. Just make sure you squeeze them a little extra tight and be a little extra thankful for what you have because a whole hell of a lot of people don't um, and try to dedicate at least a little bit of your time to, to taking care of that too. Um, there's a really common dumb argument whenever you talk about these problems where people are like, Oh, well, you know, are you going to, how many homeless people live in your house? And, and, and how many you, if, if you have any clothes on your back at all, then you're not donating everything you have. So I don't want to hear it from you, but it's like saying, you know, if there's a massive boulder that needs to be lifted, is everyone just going to say, well, hi, why haven't you lifted it yet? When if everybody just put one finger on it, it'd be done, you know? And so that's how I see it today. We, we are, you know, supposedly the wealthiest nation in the world. We have more than enough money for, you know, tax cuts for the rich to give people their private jet as a write-off. We have money for bombs all day long. But yet we still have a massive problem with homelessness, a massive problem with hunger, a massive problem with education, can't afford health care, can't afford uh, 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 student debt relief can't afford to fix public schools up so that they're all equal and functional. Instead, we continue to rely those on income tax so that, you know, poor schools and poor districts continue to underperform and and poor kids stay poor forever because they don't get a good education. Um, Can't fix any of the real problems, can't address climate change, but holy shit, can we kill some people? And that just, for me, is what Christmas is, is whenever I see all these lights and colors and signs and and Santa Claus drinking a Coca-Cola, it's just all a large smear of 
bad paint over the uh, the dirty, disgusting, horrible, shameful reality that is our country and by extension, the global north and really capitalism in general. I mean, I, I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> you didn't tell me what this was about. <laughs> and I'm just going off the I'm top so, of my head. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just finished telling people it was going to be a lightweight show. And Mo Forrest is like, we're all going to die. Oh, that's I mean, it's as awesome. long as we that, allow awesome. the rich to stay yeah. in charge. Yeah. <laughs> dude, dude. Uh, this actually segues me into my next one. And I know you're going to have one. If you had the power to bankrupt any organization or person. Ooh. If you could just say, eh, party's over, <laughs> who would it be? Or what would it be? Come on. The the first one off the top of my head, like I could, I could probably, if you gave me time to really think about this, I bet I could come up with one that's really good and really more justifiable than the other ones. But just off- Well, if it comes up later in the conversation, like yeah. in 20 minutes, just throw it out I, there. I would like, say uh, either yeah, the yeah. Catholic or the Mormon church would be the first ones that I would jump to with, with their billions and billions of unregulated, untracked dollars of what are supposed to be tithes that help the poor instead just being used to make a lot of rich white men richer. That's, that's what I would say. And, and like, it's, yeah, I think about like what Stephen Fry said, he was debating um, with Christopher Hitchens at one point about whether or not the Catholic church is good. And he brought up Jesus and he talked about like, you know, what would that poor Jewish carpenter think of the citadels of gold what would he think of the the thrones that are you know encrusted with gemstones? What would he think of the the crowns and the scepters and the 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 uh, mass of artwork and these huge cathedrals and like what what would he think of that? I, I think he would be appalled. And yeah, I, yeah, I you know for I I don't know yeah I don't like everything about the character of Jesus, but the parts that I do like had to do with the fact that that shit shouldn't be allowed. So yeah, if I had to, if I had to, like I said, I'm sure that if I really thought about it, I could find something more, a little bit more realistic, or maybe even a little bit better to say I could pick a better organization to bankrupt. But I'm assuming when you say bankrupt, you don't just mean get rid of. You mean you re reallocate those resources. Um, if I'm, if you, you specifically use the word bankrupt, yeah, I, so like I'm, I, I think uh, defang or deprivilege someone is or an organization that's dead. like the Catholic Church is a great answer, right? Because we all know the Catholic Church has not been a force for good in the world. No. And uh, so the idea of sort of defanging the, the beast, so to speak, and taking away all the gold and the gilded thrones and the privilege and the power. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I totally buy that. I've come to the point, Forrest, and I think I said this in an interview with Cara Santa Maria months ago, where I've come to the point, I really think it's immoral to be a billionaire. Oh, like, yeah. I'm all about success. You want to go out and... And build your fortune, knock yourself yeah. out. But how many thousands of millions of dollars does one person need at some point? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are essentially, you're betraying everybody else yeah. because you didn't make it on your own. You obviously built it on the backs of other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, speak to billionaires, yeah. Forrest Balcon. No, absolutely. I, I think you're, th there is no such thing as a good person who is also a billionaire. That, that's a myth. And not even Taylor Swift. I think they just Taylor said she's Swift. a billionaire. Not even because I kind of like Taylor Swift. She seems like a like nice. Her. I don't listen. She seems like a nice person. Yeah. I, I don't have anything uh, objectively, specifically negative to say about her besides the fact that she has way too much fucking money. Um, and she was just named Times Person of the Year. I good mean, for I'm her. Just saying, I, yeah, like I said, I, okay. I with, with her specifically, and I'm sure you could find another person like this. With, with, with her specifically, I really genuinely don't know very much about her. I, I don't really listen to her music, not because I'm anti anything. I just, I just don't really listen to a lot of new music generally. Um, but like, I, uh, I, I don't have anything specifically against her. In fact, everything that I've heard about her as a person is quite good. For all I know, she is a good individual human. The problem is when you have that much money, how on earth can you just walk around in this world knowing that you have that much money and you can criticize and i do criticize the fact that money is power as much as, as much as it is in this world I, i'm a, not a fan of that whatsoever i i think that the whole system that we have it set up in general is stupid but that is the system that you live in right so if you have enough money to you know literally take take a look at any anything this school is dramatically underfunded they don't have library books they don't have the supplies they need you know parents are having to bring in kleenexes and pencils and everything like that if you have a billion dollars that doesn't have to be a problem anymore 
But like you take like Jeff Bezos, for example, you know, someone who the has, guy spends like five hundred million dollars on a yacht. Yes. To do what? Yes. And you're like, how much good could you have done and with five hundred million dollars? What kills me is like, you know, we, we, we can say, uh, uh, you know, for, for someone like Jeff Bezos, who just has ungodly, ridiculous amounts of money and is spending it on stupid things that for sure actually is enough to wipe out student loan debt, to wipe out hunger, to wipe out homelessness, to wipe out just just to be done with those problems. And just there it is. There's the there's the solution. And instead does nothing, continues to, to you know, get richer, uh, exploit more workers, fly to space in a penis shaped rocket. Good for you. You know, whatever. <laughs> um, that's it, to 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 live that way. And and I think the most important part of what I'm saying that, that will hopefully make it sound a little bit less preachy for the people that are maybe a bit skeptical of what I'm talking about. I, the most important part of this is actually what you said, where you said that you didn't get there on your own. Nobody makes that much money. We have this myth in America where we pretend like billionaires if they have that much money, then they must be super smart and super hardworking and all this stuff, you know, and, and it's because we have this idea in our head, you know, the, the way that we're taught about, you know, making yourself and building your fortune, and everything, you know, nobody believes that they're actually poor. They believe that they are temporarily embarrassed billionaires themselves who are just having to deal with some struggle right now. And eventually they'll get there, but like an actual millionaire, a multimillionaire, and a homeless person sleeping on the street without a dime to their name, those two people have a lot more in common than either one of them does to fucking Jeff Bezos. And so when you talk about how do they get there, they exploited people. They, they, they took advantage of people. They paid people way less than they're worth. They allowed people to be starving, to be on food stamps, to be on government assistance. You know, there was a, I don't know if this is still a thing, but I remember a few years ago, there was a, a big public outcry because like in McDonald's and Walmart, in the new hire packet was instructions on how to fill out for government assistance, how to file for food stamps and stuff. Cause you're not, they know you're not going to make enough there. There is not a single place in this country where a full-time job at minimum wage will afford a single bedroom apartment. And so like th there's these, the only explanation for this, and especially when you track, you know, how corporate profits have gone up astronomically higher than the rate of inflation, the only explanation for this is that greedy people are taking more and more money and the poorest among us are drowning. And when you talk about, you know, how did you get there? You got there because of the society that you live in. And now the society that you live in is hurting. You got there by stepping on the heads of countless thousands of workers and those workers are hurting. So either you genuinely just see human beings as stepping stones for your own personal gain, or if you are a human yourself, you have to recognize that you have a responsibility to those behind you now. I grew up very, very poor. I grew up living off of charity. I grew up living off of, we had food stamps, we had disability checks, we had social security checks, and even that wasn't enough. And we got a lot of money and a lot of food from charities here in, here in Oklahoma. Um, there was one that I don't think is around anymore called Angel Food, where you'd pay a, a very small amount of money and you get a box and you walk down the line, they'd put in a bunch of, you know, random whatever foods and whatnot like that. And they give you, it was cheap stuff. You know, they give you a steak that flaked apart like fish because it was like canning meat squished into a package. They give you a showboat brand baked beans, y'all. If you ever want to know what it feels like to have all the joy sucked out of a child's heart, go buy yourself a band of show, <laughs> showboat brand baked beans and give those a try and taste sadness. It, it, it's like, but like, that's, that's how I grew up. And because of that, you know, I was surrounded by a lot of diversity and I learned that, you know, everybody has the same needs. And so I made a commitment before I ever made it to a point where I had a successful or even, I don't know what you call successful, this a functional career where I'm now able to keep my own lights on because of what I do for a living. At least half of everything that I do is for free. I genuinely believe that education is the most important thing in the world. And so every, uh, all the educational materials I put on YouTube, I try to do for free. I, I don't, try to charge for anything unless it's extraneous. And I'm trying like hell to do more charity work. And that's not to say, look at me, you know, I'm so, I'm so fucking fancy. All I'm saying is like, that seems to me to be like the bare goddamn minimum of like, I, I don't think that I, there should be any praise for any of that. I think that is the bare minimum to say, this is where I came from. I have now escaped. Everybody else come with me. 
let's try to make everything else a little bit better for these guys too, because there's still people there. Instead of if you're a billionaire, like you must just see these people as resources. And I, I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. Um, it, it makes me genuinely uncomfortable. I don't know. I don't know if we should use any of that. This is you. why, <laughs> this is why I didn't send him any prep. <laughs> right. I don't, he, he doesn't need prep. He's Forrest Valkyrie. Right. I don't know how much of that okay. you want to use. It's it's a little, I, I could tell I'll it's kind of, it it's somewhat preachy. And I apologize for that sincerely. I really don't, I don't ever want to come across like I'm saying, like, oh, I'm doing it so well. And you, you know, it just, I don't know. No, no, no. I think, uh, I think you're relating to what a lot of people, I mean, we live in a nation where it's all, over, first of all, we want freedom, but we don't want societal responsibility, right? Everybody's right. like freedom, freedom, freedom. And then they sell the rugged individuality angle as if pull yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. is what privileged people say to the underprivileged. It's a way to wash your hands and say, well, if you're poor or you're failing you or you're hard. miserable or you're destitute, yeah, come on, suck it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they divide people into categories. There are producers and takers. Not that there aren't producers and takers in this world. We've all met people who build and make and other people who are more parasitic. But to reduce everything to, well, you're poor and miserable or you're suffering, that means it's it's sort of victim blaming yeah. in that well, it's, it's like So I think people can relate to that. It's like when I talked about for a minute ago, I, I mentioned um, you know the, the minimum wage and whatnot. It's still stuck at, what is it, 725 still? And, you know, when you talk about that and you talk about, you know, wanting to raise that and give people a living, a living wage, something that they can actually work a full time job at the lowest possible wage and still be able to afford food and a place to live and maybe, some, you know, some, a, a car to get around in would be nice, you know. And so many people are like, well, these aren't supposed to be super lucrative. This is supposed to be an entry level job. This is supposed to be, you know, it's, people are supposed to go there to learn. And it's like all you're telling me is that you accept the fact that this job is necessary. You just think that it's important for the person doing this job to be starving. How does that work? You know what I mean? It's like I didn't mean to get him started again. Well, I got him started well, again. Th th I think about that shit. Like, how stupid do you have to <laughs> fucking like th to genuinely wrap your argument up in? It's a good thing for this job to be so miserable that you can't. You have to balance. Are you gonna? pay for your house or are you going to pay for food or are you going to go to the doctor? You can either be sick or you can be, or you can be healthy or well-fed. You don't get to choose both. And you can either have a roof over your head or you can, you know, afford to get to work in the car you drive. Or you can't, you, if you have a kid, fuck you. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just, there's that. It's so insane to say that it, to me, I think the, the, the measure of a successful society is how that society treats the very, very lowest people there, the, the, the very, very poorest, the very, very meekest, the least powerful, the most sick, you know, whoever it is that's at the bottom of the social ladder, so to speak, those people are the measure of success. If those people have equal opportunities and happy lives and are able to make something for themselves and pursue happiness in their own way without worrying about dying on the street because you literally can't afford to live anymore. Your society is fucking broken. If, if that isn't accomplished, like that's, that's what gets me incensed is that like in this country, you can literally be too poor to live. And that, fundamentally means that little green pieces of paper in some way or another equate to human life and then exceed it a little bit whenever they get together in groups. And that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. If you're any country, any nation, any government that allows any person to not be able to reliably gain access to food, water, shelter, and medicine is failing. I totally understand your frustration. I totally get it. Uh, I we're we're moving in a different direction than what I had intended, but I think this may be a good thing. I'm sitting over here with all these lighthearted questions, and <laughs> I I mean I I guess the activist in us is always going to go toward world changing conversations, yes. which is totally fine. Um, I had this question, and it relates to religion. Yeah, where have you seen, or what is the best depiction of Satan that you've ever seen? I don't know, it can be in film or maybe a 
in a video game, whether it's Diablo or elsewhere, maybe a painting, literature. Oh, flip. You know, it's funny because whenever we are engaged in the culture, you know, God is always sort of this nebulous, soft focus Thomas Kincaid painting. Usually doesn't even have a face. Mm. You just see white light coming down. And Satan is usually awesome <laughs> because he's got characteristics and he's got the either the horns or the eyes or fangs or a great voice or a cape or yeah. or you know or he's sexy or whoever and I'm like you know Satan always gets the best stuff but throughout your life in any genre what's the best Satan you've ever seen um I would say the best Satan was actually not Satan itself but but a character from mythology that was i think a, a major influence especially on on the way we modern peoples see satan whether we uh, uh, prometheus the the play prometheus bound i think um is is the best depiction of of what i think people think of as satan today and definitely of the character of satan i know this probably isn't exactly what you're going for but like in, no, I know. I'm totally interested. Can you flesh that out for those of us yeah. who are not familiar with Prometheus? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Prometheus was a titan, um, and the the story is that he stole fire from the gods and gave it to to humanity. And for this crime, the gods crucified him. They chained him to a, a large boulder on the top of a mountain, and every single day, an eagle would come down and eat his liver out of him and kill him. And then every morning, the liver would regrow, and he'd wake back up, and it would happen again the next day. And so that's that's the idea of Prometheus you know, in a nutshell. But Prometheus Bound is a a, a play um, that anybody can go read the, the the book. I forgot who wrote it. Uh, it was God knows how long. But uh, the the in the play they kind of detail out the character a little bit more. So it's non canonical, but it's still important. And they ask him, you know, why are you being punished? You know, what are you being punished for? What what happened? And he says, I I stole fire and all this stuff. And the the people are like, that doesn't sound like a justification for this. Like, what's what's going on? Like, what did you actually do? Um, and he said the thing that he actually did was he gave humans hope. He he put that fire in their hearts and he gave them undying hope for for a new world and 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 to to you know, a ambition and to be better and to, to, to never be too afraid to succeed. And I, I forgot exactly how he put it in there. It's, it's been a long time since I read it, but like that was, that was what he was actually punished for was that he made humans scary to the gods. The gods were now frightened of the, the power that the humans held because they had undying hope in their hearts that they could, you know, overcome anything and that they could achieve whatever they wanted to, and that they would never be uh, uh, beaten by despair. And that was what Prometheus was being punished for. And that is what I see in the Satan character in the Bible. And, and just in general, the way that I perceive the character overall is that, you know, especially when you look at Christianity, uh, you look at the, the stories of the Bible, um, you know, you start out, God makes everything and then he makes the Garden of Eden and he makes humans in there. Um, and then God invents one other thing that the Bible doesn't expressly mention. God invents lying. The very first lie in the Bible is told by God. He says, here's the tree of knowledge. And if you eat of this tree, you will die. And there's a lot of apologists out there that say, well, you die a spiritual death. And it meant that they weren't immortal anymore and they die eventually. But no, what it says is, if you eat it, eat of this tree, you will die the same day. You will be dead. And that's the first lie ever told. And then Satan, which it's actually the serpent. It never specifically says that the serpent is Satan, but people, I guess, interpret it that way. All the serpent actually does, he has like one line. He tells the truth. He says, why wouldn't you eat from this tree? And Eve's like, oh, I, I heard I'll die. And he says, no, you won't. And that's the whole conversation. There's no temptation. He just says, that's not true. He just tells the truth. And then they eat the fruit and then everything goes to shit from there. And that to me is the same character is here's this God that wants complete control that wants humans to be afraid of him. It says, you know, you must fear me all the time uh, that wants humans to be beholden to him, to be subservient to him. The whole idea of a power dynamic, you know what I mean? You talk about keeping someone ignorant, keeping someone weak, keeping something, uh, someone impotent, keeping someone unable to change their situation. What better way to free yourself than through knowledge? 
I mentioned that earlier. I, I genuinely think that education, especially science education, is the best way to improve somebody's life and lives of everybody else around them and to free them from the circumstances that they're born under. And that's exactly what God tries to withhold is knowledge. And Satan tells the truth and says, you won't die. Try it. See what happens. Well, it's interesting as we uh, get into Old Testament mythology as uh, Satan, which actually means adversary. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And the, the God, well, you know, Satan and Lucifer in that context may not be necessarily the same character. Right. But I always think, you know, what did Lucifer do wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. Lucifer in heaven before he was cast out. First of all, God, who is omniscient, created Lucifer, knowing that he would rebel. Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry, who's responsible for that? And then what did Lucifer say? He's like, well, I'm not going to be, you're not going to oppress me. I'm going to kind of do my own thing. I'm going to think for myself. And he's cast out. And, uh, you know, how many people in the Bible did Yahweh kill? The character of Yahweh in the Bible is a, a lunatic, is megalomaniacal, genocidal, cruel, stupid. Um, like you, you mentioned just a second ago, he, he, he knows everything that's ever going to happen, and yet he can't foresee the fact that people are going to rebel and that Satan's going to rebel and that all this. It says in the Bible that he regrets making us right before he sends in the flood to drown everybody on earth for being wicked. Why didn't you see that coming? Unless it was part of your plan that people would disobey your plan and then you'd have to kill them and then send them to hell, which means part of your plan is sending people to hell. You made these people so that you could be disappointed in them and torture them forever on purpose. An example that I usually give is like if I get in my car and the gas gauge says I have 10 miles left and I try to drive my car 100 miles, I can't be pissed at the car when it runs out of gas. I knew it was going to happen. If I TiVo a, a, a football game and I say, all right, I, I, you know, I watch the game, I know the whole thing, and then I say, all right, well, I'm going to watch it again, but if this team loses again, I'm going to punish them. It's not like they could do anything different. I already know the outcome, right? And so here's God knowing everything, knowing what every person's going to do, knowing every person's heart, knowing every, the past, present, and future of everything with a complete plan. If there is any sin in the world, it is the result of his plan. Otherwise, we're more powerful than God, and we can do things that he didn't want us to do. I saw that um, poster that said, why would God ever create a single person he foreknew would end up in hell? Yeah. I've actually had that question offered up to people and they usually spin into, well, it's a fallen world or he wanted mm -hmm. us to have free will, uh -huh. which I think is just a total non sequitur. Like, what are you, ta what? Yep. What are you talking about? Free, free will, will doesn't like mean shit if he knows what the choice is going to be. Uh, and like yeah. J Mike as another one of the hosts on AXP, he, he brought up a really good point. He was just said like, logically speaking, is it logically possible that, you know, the last time I sinned, let's say, could I have freely made the correct choice? And of course I could have. That's the whole point of trying to be a better person. If you, you become a Christian, you try to be better. You're trying to use your free will to make better choices, right? So is it logically possible that I made the correct choice? Yes. Is it logically possible the time before that, that I freely made the correct choice? Yes. Is it logically possible that given complete freedom, everybody always made the, free, the, the correct choice in every single instance completely freely? Absolutely. It's very, very statistically unlikely. It's the farthest possible end on the bell curve, but it is a logical possibility. So that means that it was in, amongst the possibilities for God to create a world that way. God could have created a world in which everybody had free will, complete freedom, and still made the right choice morally every single time. And there was no need for a flood and there was no need to sacrifice a son and there was no need for hell everybody was already perfect completely freely and everything was just great that's a completely po logical possibility if anything besides that exists it's because he chose it on purpose so if you make a mistake sure you can say you have free will but at the end of the day god shows the world where you do that and he already knew you were going to do it and he instrumented he orchestrated the the conditions in which you make that choice and all the things leading up to that choice and also made the hell for you to be punished in knowing that you'd go there that's 100 percent of just his problem we talk about uh, the the starving children the war the the corruption the abuse oh, yeah. the suffering and people say well it's because we have free will and we chose, and that's why, you know, shit went down. 
And so I say, well, is there any suffering in heaven? Absolutely not. So you're telling me that there would be no free will in heaven, right? Because if the byproduct of free will is imperfection yeah. and failure and suffering, that means if there's none of that in eternity, there would be no free will in eternity, and then their head explodes. Yep. And uh, then the cleanup on that question is just terrible. I, I've, just I've terrible heard some people us. say that that's actually the way that it should be, that 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 the best part of heaven is that you're just a slave forever, and you just all, all heaven is is constant worship and adulation. And that, to me, sounds a whole lot like hell. Um, like hell, yeah. <laughs> and like that's, to me, you know, I you asked about the character of Satan and everything and, and how he's, he's seen as this rebellious character, the rebellion against tyranny. My favorite part of the Bible, or I should say one of my favorite parts of the Bible, is Isaiah chapter 14. They're, they're talking about Lucifer. And they're, uh, uh, they say, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut uh, down to the ground, uh, which did weaken the nations? For thou have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the high. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that's the last. They, they talk a little bit more, but like that's the last thing that it's a quote of Satan. They're saying you said these things, but like that's as far as I remember, like the last quote from Satan in there of Lucifer, I should make the distinction. And I love that 14, Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What an ambition. I'm going to be better than this God. I'm going to put myself up there. And you can say that this was for selfishness or greed or arrogance or whatever like that. Who knows? Maybe it is. I don't know the character any further than that. But in terms of like my life and what I want to do, everybody tells me that like, oh, you can see God all around you. Look at the look at the flowers. Look at the flowers and the trees and the clouds and all this beauty that we're. Meanwhile, millions of people die. Millions of people are raped. Millions of people starve. Millions of people deal with cancer. What I'm going to do with my life as best as I can, I'm going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to make myself like the most high. I'm going to find a way to change this broken world and make sure that everybody has food and make sure that everybody has access to clean drinking water and make sure that we cure diseases rather than just putting them off and kicking them down the road and make sure that there is no more corruption in governments, make sure that there is no money having power over people's votes, make sure that people actually have the ability to represent themselves and make the world around them better, make sure everybody is educated and healthy and free, and then I'll plant a whole fucking garden of flowers to prove that I am mightier than this shitty, useless God that sits there and makes a fancy fucking cloud while children starve to death. I think that's a great ambition for all of us to have. Isaiah 14, 14, one of my favorite parts of the Bible. It's funny. A lot of people who do the look at the trees or how could you see the birth of a beautiful child and, and not believe in God because nature right. is fine tuning. And then you and I are like, well, have you heard of the guinea worm? Yes. That crawl has to live in the eyeball. No. You know, that's how it survives. That's and, not what it does, but there things. is there are worms that do that. The guinea Wait, wait, wait. The guinea worm doesn't live in the eyeball. No, the guinea worm lives in your legs. Lo loa loa lives in the eyeball. Loa loa lives in the eyeball. Loa, Which one loa. lives in the penis? Isn't there one that's in the ocean and it will fly into your penis? Candiru fish. Um, Those are candiru fish. See, why would you know that? <laughs> how do why you wouldn't know I? that? <laughs> The worm that lives, it follows like, a, that's just why you never want to pee in the ocean because it it's, follows it's certain, the stream. It's, I think it's a freshwater fish. It's in certain rivers. But like, yeah. The, the, Jesus Christ. How much about this can I get wrong? <laughs> it's not even the ocean. It's freshwater. There are there are worms <laughs> that live in eyeballs. So there's a couple of them, actually. There's one that's just called the African eye worm. And I believe that is Loa Loa. Um, and that one is, uh, uh, most people who have it don't even know they have it. It lives in all sorts of different fascial layers of your body. Um, and occasionally you'll see one wiggle across your eye and they're generally harmless except for extreme cases um but then there is another one that causes a, a condition known as river blindness that does actually just eat through your eyeballs it pierces the uh, the the um uh, globe of the eye and lives inside your eyeball and it, and it just, just completely blinds you and there are statues in certain parts of the world of children leading their blind parents around with a stick because it's just such a common part of life for the parents to be blind by a certain point because these worms are everywhere 
And then there's other ones. There's a bunch of other crazy. I put out a whole video. If you want to see something just genuinely horrific, um, <laughs> uh, this last uh, uh, here in October, it was for, for a Halloween special. Um, I put out a video on my YouTube channel of ranking my top favorite parasites. And both of the eye worms were on there as well as tapeworms and uh, uh, all sorts of other, Giardia was on there, uh, uh, Entamoeba histolytica, really cool amoeba that'll give you amoebic dysentery where you poop yourself so hard that your heart gives out. That's a real thing, dude. Um, oh, hang on, hang on. No, 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 wait, yeah, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I, I could shit myself into a heart attack? You could shit yourself into a heart attack. Entamoeba histolytica causes a type of amoebic dysentery where, because dysentery by itself is dangerous because you die of dehydration, but amoebic dysentery, um, you you literally poop so hard, you die of exhaustion. Um, you poop so regularly and so fervently that your heart will give out. It's a crazy, crazy thing. And you know how you get it? You get it from eating cysts, which are found in infected waters and or contaminated food. And you get the contaminated food from the poop of somebody who has those things. It's a whole poop mouth cycle. Most parasites have a poop mouth cycle. Um, just there's there's a lot of them, and you'd be shocked at how often poop mouth happens, especially if you're around children. Which is reason number ten billion why I don't fucking have any. Because I oh right. god, all they right. scratch right. their right. holes and they touch things, and then you put it in your mouth. It just, it, and you get pinworms, and that's how that's oh. That's science. That's the circle of life, y'all. That's that's the world you live in. You well, think about that for five I've minutes and heard. tell me there's a God. God always says, uh, well, what I've heard from the apologist, I can't believe we're still talking about this, but this just pops into my brain that everything was perfect. Ah, right? yeah, there yeah. were no worms, guinea or otherwise. <laughs> All the animals were vegetarian. The lions ate tofu and plants mm -hmm. and or maybe just lived on oxygen like some of the new agers out there today. And, and uh, then after the fall. Yeah. That's when they decided they developed a taste for blood. And that's when weed started to grow. Have you ever toured the Creation Museum? I have not. Uh, Ken Ham's. There's a whole section that shows Adam having to go and, and toil in the garden. And there's a plaque and it says weeds. And they're making the point that there were no weeds. It was only just pure grass, fescue or Bermuda, I'm oh. guessing, until the sin happened. And then weeds began to sprout. Damn it, Adam and Eve. You're the reason that we have to go out and spray for weeds. You know what, though? They the did garden. a great thing for Monsanto Corporation. They couldn't make Roundup without <laughs> Adam and Eve and the sin. Uh, it, it, you mentioned guinea worm. I forgot to, to say also, um, guinea worm, what it does is uh, you drink contaminated water, only it doesn't come from poop this time. Uh, what the guinea worm does is it burrows into the tissues in your legs. Uh, the adults do. I forget where. It lives somewhere else in your body until it gets to your legs as an adult. And then it forms this blister on your feet or the bottom of your legs. And when that blister touches water, it bursts open. And then there's the end of a worm sticking out of it. And it starts pooping out all of its eggs out into the water so that somebody else can drink it. And that's the life cycle of the guinea worm. Um, and so they're... Um, the way that they're used to be treated is you can see pictures online. People will burst that blister, grab the worm, tie it around a matchstick. And it's very thin. It's a filamentous. I think it's a nematode, actually. And so if you pull it, it's going to break. And so you just slowly twist that matchstick once a day and wind this worm around the matchstick day by day until it finally comes all the way out. And that's how it used to be treated. Fun fact, Life Straw, not a sponsor, but I have some laying around. Um, uh, independent personal filtration methods like this uh, have made it so that cases of guinea worm have gone from uh, like several million cases back in the 1980s to about 15 annual cases uh, now. In, in, in this day and age, about 15 people a year get guinea worm because of personal filtration like this. Um, and it is on course to be the first parasite ever eradicated. We eradicated smallpox. It was the first virus ever. And now we're about to eradicate the first parasite ever. And it's going to be guinea worm, but guinea worm. Let me... Uh Make sure I understand. So what are the like charities distributing these around the Amazon, et cetera, or wherever the guinea worm is yeah, located? You, you, yeah, you, you do a, a, a clean water. There, there are charities that, that provide clean water filtration, um, build wells and things like that. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's about water san uh, sanitization. And so you can have san several different ways of sanitization, but especially shit like that, where you have like a personal one, because a lot of these places you're kind of spread out, sparse little villages here and there. And so, yeah, it's it just sanitation and, and filtration are, are killing the guinea worm. Talking here with Forrest Valkai. Um, so, I don't know, this is kind of a, 
I guess, a party favor question, but you talk a lot about evolution. If you could evolve a specific trait or characteristic, if you could evolve, you could choose uh, what you evolve, then you could do it in your own lifespan. Oh, okay. What would you have? I was, I was, what would you choose? I was going to because be, I thought you were going to you were going to go off into the whole well individuals, individuals don't, don't evolve populations evolve you know yeah exactly. all right come on I was absolutely going to do that just to be a no, pest no no uh, we are we are just having a hypothetical if you had a characteristic or trait you could choose what it is to enhance yourself what would it be ah uh, flip dude like a th- third eye in the back of your head oh, or like infrared vision no, that or be, that uh, be a nightmare um honestly uh seeing seeing other wavelengths of light would be uh pretty sick so, so it, it kind of it devolves into this conversation about like superpowers so to speak or you could do it and like the if you focus on being stronger you have to remember that bus, uh, muscle mass is going to be proportional to bone mass so there's no way to be super strong without having just like crazy thick bones and there is a limit to where that can develop so i don't know if i'd want to focus on that um as far as being able to see different wavelengths of light that would be interesting up until the point where it suddenly very wasn't like what if i could see radio waves that'd be horrific uh, i don't want to deal with that i don't want to have to see radio waves all over. I, I don't know maybe other wavelengths would be cool infrared be pretty cool uh ultraviolet would be way cool because then i could see things like insecty things uh, there are yeah many animals in the animal kingdom, think, non-human animals who do see in the infrared. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah. They can see yeah. a lot. Of, a lot of snake can see infrared, and a lot of insects can see ultraviolet, and that's pretty freaking sick. Um, I would say the uh, I would want to continue evolving in the direction of the hominin lineage and keep getting just like a, a stupid big functional awesome brain i want my brain to be like 30 percent wrinklier um and and have a lot more surface area <laughs> and i'd want to be able to soak up more information faster my, my so my actual superpower dream since i was a little kid like a, the thing that i've always if i could have some magical ability would be to absorb all the information in a book just by like touching it just like instantly absorb knowledge you know what i mean so if i could get close to that through like forced single generation evolution and like just get to the point where i can just retain knowledge way faster that'd be pretty tight i'd, I'd be i would be very down with that because i could do a lot of good things with that i could help a lot more people if i was smarter um so yeah that's that's what i would do I think, you know, I've, I've always wanted, you know, the photographic memory thing. And I don't mean remembering everything all at once, yeah. but I mean, having like a Google Drive kind of thing yeah. where someone says, hey, do you remember what happened 25 years ago? And I could just say, okay, well, let me go back to that file yeah. so that I don't have the distortions of memory. I could actually know someone's name five minutes after they told it to me at a party kind of <laughs> right. a thing. Another thing, and I'm giving a speech uh, about, um, and I just finished narrating an audio book for Dr. Abby Hafer about the not so intelligent designer. And I'm doing a speech along those lines in 2024. I would like to have a pain gauge like, or a pain regulator, yeah. right? What's the purpose of pain? And you can correct me on this, Mr. Biologist, but it's to allow us to know that we are wounded or injured and the severity of the injury and then pain avoidance, sure. right? It is a survival thing. We do not want to injure ourselves, mm. endanger ourselves. And so pain becomes a deterrent. Would that be fair? Yes, yeah, that's pretty good to say. Also, in case you want to know, okay. there actually is a word for pain. We call it nociception. Okay, well, thanks. For, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll remember that if I'm ever on Jeopardy. Uh, you just have to throw out. You just have to be an elite. Don't you want to know you, if there's a cool sh- thing? I want to know. Sh- Show me how ignorant I am on the subject. Okay. No, no, no. It's awesome. So, so let's say I'm horribly injured. Let's say, you know, and the first thing we do as human beings is we go and intervene and try to get an, uh, a medication, morphine or whatever, even aspirin. We're trying to mitigate the pain. This is something that we do. I would include that within us. Like maybe not immediately, right? We mm-hmm. still want pain avoidance. We still want to know that we're being injured. But once we do know- yeah an excruciating burn, I would like the ability to be able to turn that down until I can go and get help. I don't think that's an unreasonable evolution. I would be- I don't know. Would you agree? Be, Good, bad? I mean, I, I can make the case for continued pain because even if I like break my arm and I'm like, okay, I now understand that my arm is broken. I can stop feeling this anymore. And then I try to get up because I'm stupid and I don't think about it. I'm going to make it worse. So like having the continued pain helps you not continue hurting yourself in that way that's kind of a use for it, but I definitely could deal with that. 
I would say also like referred pain. Referred pain is kind of problematic. I'm having a heart attack, so my arm hurts like hell. What's going? You know what I mean? And that's all because of the development of dermamyotomes and shit. But like, I I, I think it would be nice to be able to be like, oh, this is the thing that feels like a heart attack. It's like a light switch. You could just whoop the heart attack thing lit up, and I'm not I'd be like, why is my arm so weird? And I'm slightly out of breath. And like, you know what I mean? And then suddenly I'm on the floor. That would be that would be pretty sick. So you've got like a little LED meter and it says this is exactly what's going readout. on. Your appendix is about to, to burst. Yeah, like you got something on your thing. car and it's like, you know, I remember when back in the 2000s, my dad had you know this car that had like this, the kind of dot matrix digital readout of like several green <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? And like, uh, and it, 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 anytime anything was broken, it would just pop up and it would say check gagas because it didn't have enough room for the word gauges. So it would just say check gagas. Uh, and uh, that was the most fucking futuristic, crazy. Oh, I thought we were in a spaceship. Um, and now my car has like a whole like cell phone screen on the thing that will pop up. And you're like, your tires are flat, idiot. You know, whatever. It'll give you a bunch of details. We'll have something like that. Well, a little, little Darth Vader thing on our chest is just like, yo, your pancreas is a problem. Go f- check it out. That'd be pretty sick. A check engine light <laughs> on our bodies. Because right. way too many people get a horrifying doctor's phone call at you know four in the afternoon on a random Tuesday, telling them they're you know need to figure out their their blast affairs now. Um, so like I think it would be cool to have like a check engine light of some kind, just something to let us know what specifically is going on, and that, or at least when it's time to get something checked. All right, let's uh, let's talk. You and I both live, I think, about. 20 minutes from each mm-hmm. other in the state of Oklahoma as they bring you being an educator as you watch them bringing Prager U in. Yeah. And, and I know that, that Prager U is being introduced in other educational systems. They're trying to really infiltrate this uh, hardcore yeah. Christian right non science into public education. Mm-hmm. Um, you just want to speak to, I mean, what are your thoughts into 2024 mm-hmm. as we are? Going head to head. I mean, I will end with a serious question. How in the world does an educator educate in this climate, man? Yeah. So uh, the as far as PragerU is concerned, um, yes, our absolute fucking dump of a superintendent in the state here did uh, make an order that he we could have PragerU in our schools. Um, I guess we should forgive me. We must, I guess, uh, define what PragerU is. Yeah. So PragerU is a non-regulated non-accredited, not university. It's it's as much of a university as Trump University was. It's just a a conservative organization, a, an open, and this is not a, n- nothing that I'm saying here is out of turn. They are a self-described politically, preser- a conservative, politically motivated organization whose intention is to spread conservative and, and uh, Christian messages. And they do they they spread it to mainly their main target audience is young adults, and then they do have a kids section as well, which is just for little kids. And they do this through what they call creative video making, which is they're they're putting stuff up on YouTube basically. Um, and so they make YouTube videos to promote conservative Christian ideology and value, uh, and they put that out for for people to learn a very very inaccurate history of the world and le- very inaccurate lessons on economics, very inaccurate lessons on religion, very inaccurate lessons on science. And all of that's fine. They are allowed to do that. You know, that's th- whatever. Uh, the issue is that this unaccredited, unregulated, not educational organization with an open, clear mission statement that you can read on their website to spread conservative values and fight against, you know, wokeism or whatever else. This political organization with no accreditation and no governmental regulation is now being allowed to oh, fuck I'm slapping my microphone is now being allowed into public schools in several places uh, it started out in Florida now Oklahoma I think there's another uh, state that's that's doing the same thing if I remember right the uh, I, I made a whole video about it if you look up on my YouTube channel I have like an hour-long video primarily about Stephen Meyer who's a, a pseudoscientist who who promotes creationism because you can't randomly change computer codes and therefore you can't randomly change DNA. And that means evolution isn't real, which is an insane argument. Um, but the first half of the video is dedicated to him. The second half of the video is dedicated to PragerU where I show clips from PragerU videos where, again, this is meant to be taught to kids. They talk about how evil feminism is. They talk about how evil socialism is. They talk about how colleges and universities are political indoctrination centers. They talk about 
how, uh, you know, they, they have a whole video for the kids where it's the little cartoon people um, going out and meeting historical figures and the little cartoon people go out and meet Christopher Columbus. You know, Christopher Columbus is up there saying like, oh, well, yeah, the, the, the natives that I met uh, were very nice people and I ordered my men to treat them very well ignoring the fact that he actually captured them as slaves and 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 had a whole like sex slave thing going on and would chop people's hands off if they didn't bring him gold and shit like that and then they're like well we hear that you had slaves and he's like slavery is as old as time everybody had slaves and besides being a slave is better than being murdered isn't it and the kids are like yeah you really are a good guy for not murdering them and just having them be slaves instead uh, and then they meet frederick douglas and motherfucking Frederick Douglass tells the kids that they shouldn't be radicals or activists um, because you should just work within the system and that America had to have slavery because that that made America as great as it is. Um, and then uh, and that slavery was just a compromise to make this great country. And that means it's all worth it. Um, and uh, uh, they, they just oh, man. They, and then they meet Ronald Reagan and suck his dick for like fucking 30 minutes. And there's like literally this whole thing. Remember, these these are children's videos, and the, the characters, the cartoon characters, are themselves children. They say at one point or another that they're in middle school. So they're middle school age children. And they're sitting there going, like, Ronald Reagan was an actor, and he was an athlete, and he was a swimmer, and he did all this stuff. And then the little girl's like, and he was so handsome. And it's like an adult, a grown adult sat down and made a cartoon of a middle school girl having like romantic, like, like just falling in love with Ronald fucking Reagan. De oh my God. Did you, I want to take a shower thinking yeah. about that. Anyway, the point is um, that's now allowed in a lot of public schools. I, uh, uh, you and I live in Tulsa and I called um, uh, the Tulsa public schools uh, uh, board of education. And I also called, Broken Arrow, which is where I grew up just outside of Tulsa, um, and the superintendents of both of those school districts uh, assured me that they have no intention of ever implementing this shit, um, which is very nice. It's allowed, but they're not going to fucking do it. Um, and to anybody in the comment section watching this right now that thinks that any of this is acceptable, that we need to have, you know, this, this organization, just genuinely ask yourself for a second, what would you do if it was the exact opposite thing? I know that you probably, if you think the PragerU is any kind of good, you probably think that schools are somehow liberal or woke or whatever like that. But genuinely, if a school district was like, hey, here's whatever the hell the woke version of PragerU is. Here's this super, you know, very, very leftist organization that's going to come in and teach the kids about communism and teach the kids about whatever gender thing you're afraid of or whatever it may be you know would you think that that was as acceptable as the prager you thing or is it only when it's ideologies that you like that you're okay with blatant indoctrination of children um and, and like that's that's what frustrates me is people get mad at schools being inclusive and at schools having up-to-date history about the united states and about schools being honest about like the fact that we weren't always the good guys, you know, and they have all these issues with us addressing racism and addressing sexism and addressing homophobia and talking about the real problems of the world. And they're like, ah, oh, no, we should just teach that America's great. And then you have this organization over here that is openly admitting to the fact that what they do is political indoctrination. Not my word, by the way. If you watch my video, there's a clip of Dennis Prager saying, yes, what I do is indoctrination. I bring doctrines to children. What's wrong with that? So like, openly politically conservative, politically motivated religious organization trying to teach conservative lessons to children. If you think that's okay, I don't want to, I can't take you seriously when you try to tell me that schools are too woke or like, oh, we're, we're teaching the children to be liberals because we're telling them that it's okay to be gay and that you just, I, I have no patience for your argument anymore. If you're okay with Prager, you absolutely not. The lesson here is, is if you have Forrest Valkai on your podcast, do not send him any prep. <laughs> just have things like Prager U, et cetera, I, queued up. Just throw the word I out. I could have just said like three things. I could have written like two paragraphs no, of no, succinct information. No. You, you would have not held to the, uh, the written word. You would have used them as a platform, which is why we love you, which is why you are a necessary part of uh, what we're doing. And I'm, uh, honestly, I'm a fan. I, I just love you to death. I, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're 
you were part of sort of this, I'll call it a holiday show. It's it's mostly a chance for us just to kind of hang out as we wrap up 2023. Tell everybody about your channel and your work, where to find you, what you're doing. Just, you know, give me the brochure. Brother. Yeah. Uh, so, um, hi, my name's Forrest. I'm a biologist and I teach science on the internet. If you like science, atheism, and general weirdness, check out my channels. I teach people to love the universe and themselves and each other uh, by giving really cool science lessons along with like life-changing motivational lessons and just general uh, 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 bad, bad political takes, as you've seen here. <laughs> it's, I'm just a, a mess. Um, yeah, you can find my YouTube channel by searching for my name. You can also uh, find me on the TikTok and the Instagram and whatnot. Uh, I'm on threads now. What a fucking nightmare that is, right? But it's better than the alternatives. Um, uh, you can find me all over them internets. Just go to valkylabs.com and you'll find links to most of my stuff there. Um, please support me on uh, uh, YouTube and, and maybe Patreon if you feel like it. And I got a lot of really cool things coming up in, in 2024 that you'll enjoy if you like charity endeavors uh, and, 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 and world tours and cool animals uh, and, and interesting fun facts about the worst parts of life. If you want to question the reality that you weren't quite sure you wanted to be a part of in the first place, I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm your science teacher. <laughs> Uh, that'd be a great business card. <laughs> Question the reality that you weren't sure you wanted to be a part of in the first place with Forrest Valkyrie. That's what science class is for, man. That's yeah, what it is. Yeah. Science is not here to keep us comfortable, damn no. it. It's here to, to expand our brains so that we can have that extra 30% of wrinkly brain that Forrest Valkai wishes to have, wishes to evolve. But he wouldn't wrinkled, because man. individuals do not evolve. Populations evolved. I learned that from him. I'm so glad. My friend, Happy New Year in advance. Thanks for chatting with us, and uh, we'll talk again soon, okay? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, man. It was a lot of fun.